Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Anitsu, and you're listening to the DigiTalks podcast, the show that covers various topics from news to meta developments and everything in between for the fine folks who love the Digimon trading card game. Just as a quick reminder, I do stream this live over on twitch.tv slash Zenitsu. It's also uploaded as a YouTube video under the YouTube channel of Zenitsu, as well as being on various podcasting platforms like Spotify for your viewing and listening pleasure. If you want to help support the podcast in any way, shape, or form, or any of those respective channels, please feel free to leave a rating, like, follow, subscribe, review, whatever, depending on the platform that you're listening on. It really does help a lot. Today, I'm with a special guest, Mark, and we're going to be talking about flavor versus balance and what that means for card games. So Mark is a new special guest. Usually I do have a different Mark. This is uh, a different, different Mark. So Mark, uh, take the time to introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is Mark, a uh, fellow card game enthusiast, and also have a passion for design as well. Uh, went to college, have a have a little bit of credibility, I guess. Well, you know, take that for what you you will. But uh, I hope we uh, we can have an interesting discussion on today's topic. I think uh, I think we'll we'll hit some some pretty good points on it. Yeah. Um... Mark is, uh, to further elaborate, he was one of my uh, classmates when we were in college doing design school. So he's someone I trust and uh, somebody who I talk to quite frequently when it comes to design stuff. So that's just the background there. And yeah, so I know you're well adversed with a whole bunch of different card games. What kind of card games are you? Uh, do you generally play a little bit more? Well, generally big into Magic. Uh, used to play most of the formats, but pretty much limited to Commander now just because of the accessibility and the, the uniqueness of the format, I would say. Uh, definitely played the Digimon card game a little bit here and there. Uh, Vanguard, Weiss, Buddy Fight. I'm sure there's a million others that, uh, I mean, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! I, I don't know, the list could go on and on, but... Don't want to don't want to keep people here all day on that. Yeah, I just wanted to get people to understand where your background is. I know mostly right now you've just been playing a lot of Vanguard and Weiss and Magic. Yeah, as of late, that's been that's been what's on the on the plate. Yeah, but uh, I know we uh, talk Digimon every now and then. So uh, right now we are midst BT fifteen formats and. There is, I don't have like a countdown, but I think there's like 15 events left between all of the different English speaking regions in terms of actually here in North America, we have only a small handful before we get into wave two, uh, which wave two generally will be around BT 16. So it's not like that matters too much, but we did have two events to go over. Uh, the first one is uh, from Vortex. Uh, that is Spain. Yes, Spain. Uh, the good old Spanish. And we have the full top 16 breakdown, and we have even more metadata to look at because they actually use Limitless. Uh, bless their hearts for using Limitless because that helps give us way more information than we normally get. So as far as the archetype breakdown for top 16, we have three Numamons, two Mirage, two Divas, two Shines, two Lugamons, one Security Control, one Leviamon, one Red Hybrid, one Machine Dramon, and one D Brigade. In terms of new decks actually breaking into the format, it's just D Brigade. Um, not a bad deck, just not one people would think would be able to break into this top 16. Um... But thanks to Limitless, we could kind of see more into the story on how they were able to get into top 16. But their event was uh, 180, 188 players, seven rounds of best of three Swiss. So pretty decent event. And as far as the actual placements, I'll just make this as quick as I can possibly do. Uh, first place was Mirage, second place was Divas, third place was Security Control, fourth place was Numamon, fifth place was Levia, sixth place was Mirage, seventh was Shine, eighth was Red Hybrids, ninth was Machine, tenth was Deep Brigade, eleventh was Divas, twelfth was uh, Lugamon, thirteenth was Numamon, fourteenth was Numamon, fifteenth was Fang, uh, or uh, Fenrir Lugamon. 
And then 16th was uh, another shine. So that's their top 16. As far as actually looking at the metadata with Limitless, as far as the Mirage deck, not going to go too deep into the Mirage deck. Uh, one thing I did notice with all of the Mirage decks, including some of the ones that just went X2, which was technically good enough to make them into top 16. It's just tiebreakers said otherwise. Uh, they were all on a very similar list utilizing the BT-13 Mirage to bounce Tamers and play their own with Evade. Then they were also on the Lana, which is pretty standard at this point. Um, some of them were on three or four Zudo Aces, just because having that Zudo Ace for the early game control, especially against decks like Numemon and Red Hybrid, is like actually insanely valuable. And then they were also on two Gomas, which I think, like, right now, most of us phased Goma out because playing a Digimon for free into Leviamon, which takes advantage of being able to play Digimon for free, is just not a good idea. Uh, but against anything else but Leviamon, it's still a very good card. And going into the matchups, uh, thank you, Limitless, again, for showing us matchups, we could see that the first place played a total of zero. Yes, count it zero Leviamons and zero security controls. So it just kind of made it easier to win when you don't see your bad matchups. Uh, they played Numemon, Numemon. Uh, it says Blue Zudomon, but I actually looked at the list. It's uh, Gabu Bond, uh, D Brigade, Numemon, Belfmon, and D Brigade. And after playing Mirage extensively myself, yeah, it just makes sense why this would take first place in Swiss because. Again, zero bad matchups at all. Um, but we're not here for why first place got first place. We're here for the 10th uh, place D Brigade on why they actually managed to get into top 16. And they actually played pretty well. Um, and their matchup spread kind of reflects this, where their last matchup was Machine Dramon. Uh, which was one of the top 16 decks, and they ended up getting a tie, which really helped boosted them because they didn't lose a whole lot. The only person they lost to was the Mirage, uh, which they were able to beat another Mirage. So as long as you go fast enough, which is what you want to do, like, yeah. Uh, they played against a Ravemon, so that was probably just a free win for them. And then they probably outwalled Monzemon. I could see them doing that. And then they just kind of tried to race everything else because you do have that, like, ability to flood the field, have good protection on your Digimon, and just be able to do lots of, like, really strong disruptive things, both offensively and defensively. So it was uh, very nice to see that the deck was able to do well. And in terms of, like, looking at the matchups more specifically, I don't really think any of these were, like, super hardcore negative except for Mirage just because a lot of these aren't really tackling wide fields, which is what you're trying to do, let alone having one Digimon with some of the best protections in the game. So that's probably, if I had to take a guess, where uh, the success came from. And I'll just show the deck list real quick. It doesn't look like it's doing anything insanely different than what we've seen in the past. The only like real spice is Craniumon for probably just more protection, to be honest. Like, Protection on top of protection is just good. Uh, the one thing to note is they are using almost none. Yes, almost none of the BT-15 cards. So BT-15 cards aren't super great. They're just using the one copy of Hisaru, and that is it. So it just goes to show that the BT-15 stuff for this deck really wasn't helping it. Uh, then they just, yeah, it's, it's just... Oh, and they were also using the shoe, uh, just because she's interacting with D-Police, so there's a couple of niche interactions there. Uh, but that's pretty much it for the major, like, things when it comes to the, uh, the Vortex event. And then to kind of wrap things up, I do have the top eight deck lists, uh, well, not really deck lists, but I do have the top eight data for the, uh, the in-person Texas regionals. So I'll highlight that right here. As far as the top eight breakdown, it is Numemon, Security Control, Security Control, Belfmon, Terriermon slash Rapidmon, 
Leviathan, Red Hybrids, and Mirage. Again, nothing we haven't seen before. Uh, Belfmon is probably the biggest surprise, just because people kind of are writing it off, but I think, like, it's still a pretty strong control deck that also can just punch really hard. Similar to what Leviathan is doing, just people discredit it because... Its tools got a little bit more nerfed compared to Leviathan, which has more flexibility for doing almost the same exact thing. Uh, but in the face of the Numimon Menace, I think that it does a little bit better just because it could handle wide fields just as effective. So it's not like it's a really bad pick. And then somewhere in top 16, I know there's a Magnamon, so I don't really have a whole lot of the deck lists for them. I do have some of them, so here is one of the security controls. Uh, again, nothing new. Uh, they're using the Gallantmon as a really good card to just have a card to play for free. Swing, control the field. Outside of that, it's nothing we haven't seen. Uh, I have Red Hybrids, which again is just Red Hybrids. They're on um, more uh, Ukamon, and they're also running a Floodgate, which is good. Um, then I do have the magnamon deck so in case anyone's curious about the top 16 magnamon deck um it really i don't really think this is anything too spicy uh it's just again just magnamons and then i do have the one of the leviathan decks which again this this is all just fairly standard stuff at this point um i don't really know what else to say there's not really anything spicy or interesting about it it's just the deck so that's kind of where the meta currently is and it doesn't really look like actually i do have the updated metadata before we actually get into the real meat and potatoes so if anyone's actually curious on where the meta shifts are um this is a really bad image on just showing you where the current meta is right now we're seeing a consolidation towards six decks which is numimon leviathan red hybrids Divas, Mirage, and Shine. Those are the decks that are performing better than all of the other decks. And we do have some decks kind of creeping up in, like Yellow Vaccines and Security Control, as like the next two more prominent decks. But this is kind of just what the meta is. And based on past trends, this is just what the meta is going to be until we hit BT16, where new cards are obviously going to shake things up. Uh, so. Congrats to all players who managed to get into top slots. So now we could actually uh, transition into the meat and potatoes. But uh, before we do that, I always forget question of the week, which relates to what we're going to be talking about. So the main conversation is going to be about flavor versus balance, because that's two very difficult things to try to manage at the same time, making a card feel like it should, while it also being balanced for the rest of the game. So the question of the week is going to be, what do you think is the most flavorful Digimon card? This could either be matching the lore to an effect. This could be uh, matching the art to um, the reference that it's trying to like represent. Just in your opinion, what do you think is the most flavorful card so yeah um balance is definitely a very hard thing to do especially when trying to match lore to it and mark i know you've played just as much tcgs as i have uh how many tcgs actually borrows lore and tries to make cards lore accurate Saying in my experience, uh, there's definitely a few that I think try to do it. I know back when I played Hearthstone, I know th there was a few times where they definitely, I think they definitely nailed it when they were trying to pull lore in on the cards, but then there was other cards where it's just like, I, I, I don't even know what they're trying to get to here. This, this just feels like an absolute fail. I think they needed filler here, but I feel like in a good majority of the games, I feel like that flavor just gets kind of put to the wayside that the uh, the designers get a little bit too into the weeds on how the mechanics of the game work when they have this pre-existing lore that they can pull from so then once they get the mechanics figured out they look back at the lore and they're just like well shoot how do we integrate this into what we designed and i feel like they they fall on that quite a bit whereas digimon i feel does a 
quite an excellent job in integrating the lore and the you know the personalities of the cards the personalities of the Digimon the characters into the cards in the game and it and it feels very genuine as uh, a Digimon, like a longtime Digimon enthusiast, I do think that they uh, they match their lore to their cards insanely well. And like thinking about all of the card games that I played, most of them, their lore is actually original. So like going from Bushy Road, because uh, they have technically lore and an anime uh, for a lot of the stuff that they make, but the anime is supposed to promote the card game itself most of the time. That's how it was for Buddy Fight, and that's how it was for um, Vanguard, where you didn't exactly have lore, you just had the anime, and then the cards kind of had like their own little sub-lore that they were following that basically just matched the mechanics or made up what the, in quotation marks, clan or color was supposed to be. So, and then, like, looking at Magic as an example, like they write their lore as they're designing the cards. So, you know, there's there's not really any pre-existing stuff to pull from. They're just, yep, let's just throw this onto that, and that seems like it makes sense. Sometimes they do a good job. Sometimes, like uh, Murders at Karloff Manor, they do a really bad job. Um, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it, it's all just matching... Um, what they feel like should go on that type of card um, rather than having something pre-existing and looking at some of Bandai's other card games um, like One Piece and Dragon Ball, they don't really have lore on their cards at all in terms of what the effects are supposed to be doing. Uh, they have like, oh, navies are kind of this black thing. So let's just put them in black and they're supposed to be the control deck. So we'll just, we'll put control elements to them, but they don't like have mechanical flavor matching the character itself to the cards themselves. Uh, Dragon or yeah, Dragon Ball doesn't really do that either. Even though both of them do have pre-existing lore, most of them literally just say it on the card. Like, oh, this Goku is from the Boo Saga. This Goku is from the Saiyan Saga. Or this Luffy, based on the clothes that he's wearing in the art, he's from Wano versus East Blue versus Alabasta, so on and so forth. Um, I don't exactly play a whole lot of Weisschwartz. Uh, how, how does Weisschwartz do that? Because they, I would think that they kind of should take a Digimon approach for Weisschwartz to try to match flavor with the cards, or do they just throw whatever effects on whatever? I was going to say, in the experience I have with uh, the series that I've played, there is some level of flavor that I feel like they throw on the cards. So I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, but but generally, whatever kind of feel the anime gives for you, uh, they try, I think, to give you some mechanics that feel like they're incorporated to it. I guess uh, a, a good example would be the Spy Family set that came out pretty recently. It's, you know, about spy, obviously about spies and trying to, like, hide their secret identities, you know, normal person by day, whatever, you know, spy assassin by night kind of deal. And uh, there's certain cards in the set that have this unique ability that on your turn, the card is one way. The card uh, does a certain, you know, certain effects that are usually quite powerful offensively and very beneficial to you. But then, at the end of your turn, if you have a, the second card in your drop zone, you can actually replace your card on the field with this other card, which kind of feels more thematically of, okay, this is the, you know, this is the Lloyd spy Lloyd, he's he's doing cool stuff, and now that my turn's over, we're going to just general, you know, loving father, good good husband Lloyd, he's, he's just an excellent guy, and he has, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot of effects going on, I think that particular card allows you to heal when it comes, it hits the field, but aside from that, he's just kind of hard to, to, you know, to, to get over in terms of power, so some sets, I think they do a a, a pretty good job of trying to incorporate a kind of feel that the anime gives you. Other sets, I think, 
they just kind of get the IP. They try to make something work, but there's not a whole lot of substance to it. It just kind of feels relatively generic, I guess, is the best way to put it. Uh, that would make sense, because I was reading up on early uh, Union Arena stuff, and a lot of people were saying, like, the decks felt very homogenized. Like, they just were the same, just different flavor, like, visual flavor, but they functioned, like, almost exactly the same. And that was a big persisting problem for the first couple of sets. I hear that they're turning things around. I don't know, uh, but... It, it would make sense where if you're only pulling from, like, a particular season, because I know Weishwartz just pulls, like, season to season. So, like, you'll have, like, oh, this is Rimuru in season one versus Rimuru in season two, just as an example for uh, Weishwartz. Like, uh, there's not a whole lot of flavor that they can incorporate from that one particular season for that one particular card, especially if the art is already trying to, to, to uh, dictate, uh, if the art is already trying to show off a particular scene or action. Yeah, and I think White Shorts also kind of falls into a little bit of a rabbit hole uh, from a function standpoint, because they already have all of the mechanics built and whatnot, and they're just pulling from so many very different sources i think it's hard to get that unique feel for the flavor of the anime they're pulling from to flesh out in the mechanics of the game that they have designed and i think that's you know i think white shorts also kind of suffers from that same thing you mentioned about union arena where a lot of the decks feel very samey homogenized in a way of yeah they're doing very small things differently but at the end of this day it's like okay well these deck you know these five decks are all kind of doing the same thing they're trying to do this you know this is their game plan at you know to level one and then once it, that fizzles out i'm just building up to end game and then whatever my end game is i mean they're all it, it, it just kind of feels very similar in a sense and I think it's hard to break it out. Some of the sets, I think, like I said, they've done a really good job of making them very flavorful, feeling unique. Uh, the one that I just thought of and didn't mention was Guilty Gear. That one feels almost like you're playing a little bit of a completely different game. It almost feels like you're doing that fighting game where you're, you know, you're building your meter and you're spending your meter to do things. So it, I think it's a little bit tougher in that sense. But in the sense of, you know, like Digimon, you have one, cons you know, one consensus of lore that you're pulling from into a game that you've built mechanics for. And it's very, it feels very one-to-one -one where they're able to transfer that flavor from the source into the game itself. Yeah, and I think, like, a really good example of this is uh, Marcus. So Marcus from BT12 is a tamer card, that can make himself a Digimon as long as uh, you have an Agumon on your field. So you have your partner Digimon on the field. He can make himself into a Digimon so that way he can do combat himself. Uh, the, I, the whole gimmick behind uh, that season of the anime, Digimon Data Squad uh, or Savers, was Marcus punched Digimon. So he punched Digimon to steal their digital energy or their Digicode and then he used that energy to Digivolve Agumon, uh, or Greymon, or whatever form he was currently in, into something better. So the fact that he becomes a Digimon, can swing, and get in a free evolution into a higher stage uh, Greymon is, like, that. that's very flavorful and very thematic. Uh, from a gameplay perspective, it was kind of a little bit overboard because it was a free evolution. And we saw this with um, Apocalymon, uh, one of the more recent examples, he was an insane, he was a very well done, flavorful card in terms of trying to get the all the flavor into that card, interacting with the Dark Masters and having like his own little play style around the Dark Masters. That was kind of cool and neat and what a lot of people wanted. It's just they didn't restrict it to Dark Masters, so everyone was abusing him for the other things that he could do on top of like just you know, purple accelerating cycling, which was already innately stupid, uh, based on how fast the game 
already is moving. They just decided to crank that up to 11, and sure, you just had a perfect storm of a mess, but that didn't stop the card from being any less flavorful. And the flavors, like, seen throughout Digimon in terms of references, like Leomon, he loves to have on-delete effects, because in a lot of media dick pit, uh, that uses Leomon, he dies a lot, almost all the time. So it's just kind of funny where it's just like, oh yeah, this Leomon has an on-delete effect because he dies. Um, and then obviously you have uh, tamers interacting with Digimon. Digimon's looking for specific uh, tamers. So you have like a lot of pre-canned stuff that's just meshing well with just matching flavor to the cards. And I think Digimon does this better than almost any other card game, but sometimes almost to a detriment because balance isn't really taken into account half the time. And I think that's part of the stumbles of where Digimon as a card game falls short is it sacrifices flavor for balance and balance for flavor. Yeah, there's definitely a, a fine balance there. Uh, you would probably know better than I uh, which meta it was in particular. But I remember when Tamer Digimon came out, that was quite a shakeup in the meta. Very, you know, very flavorful for the point of... You could probably tell me which season of Digimon it was. Lord uh, Frontier. knows I watched it. Season Frontier? Four. There yep. we go. But, you know, it's very flavorful to Frontier because the... Uh, the Digimasters in that one actually turned into the Digimon themselves. And it was a very unique mechanic of, oh, hey, I have this tamer. Crap, he's not really doing anything for me. Uh, for one memory, what the heck? I'll Digivolve him into this, you know, not super strong per se Digimon, but it comes out and it can swing if the tamer's been on the field. And stuff like that, I think at the time, would really catch people off guard because they're just like, Oh, what's he gonna do? He, you know, he's got this one Digimon out, whatever. And then all of a sudden, and if you, you know, you play one raw from your hand, it's like, well, he's not gonna swing with that. But then, if you had that tamer and you digivolve the tamer, it's like, ah, oh, crap! Now he's got something that can swing. And in a lot of cases, it wasn't all that expensive to digivolve that particular Digimon up to its next evolution and make something quite frightening, actually. Yeah, ta like that's where. Digimon, I feel like, does a really good job at matching that lore to create new mechanics that no other card game can really replicate to the same level of a success. Like, Magic kind of has something similar, not really, where, like, you have abilities to turn, like, artifacts and enchantments into uh, monsters in order to do combat, but it's not exactly done the same way. And they've tried, like, how Digimon kind of does evolution. Uh, they've tried like their own style of that and it, it just became a mess and harder to track because the game wasn't really meant to support that type of play style where Digimon was built from the ground up based on the mechanics that they're trying to interpret from the lore and like I think that's one of the biggest appeals to Digimon in my uh, perspective is just that marriage of mechanics to lore. And then sometimes they just want to have vanilla cards, not like actually vanilla cards, but they just have certain functions that just exist as functions. And they just throw a Digimon on top of that it, without really any rhyme or reason, because it just kind of doesn't matter what Digimon is supposed to be fitting inside of this function, because that's one thing that a lot of card games do is they focus on, the functionality of the card. What is the card doing? What does it need to do? And how is it supporting the rest of the game by being what it is? Exactly. And I think Digimon could also fall into a little bit of the opposite trap, where uh, perhaps when they're designing their sets, they're you know they have a couple of select Digimon where they're like, okay, these are going to be some of our big headliners in one of the particular sets. So obviously, we're going to have to design a you know design a good card for this particular Digimon. And I think you kind of mentioned it already with Apocalypse Mon, but he is very flavorful. He has some really crazy good interaction and really strong abilities. Unfortunately, maybe he's a little too flavorful in the sense of, well, maybe not enough flavorful, perhaps. 
in the instance where you said he doesn't just only interact with Dark Lords, he can do other interactions. And I think that's where you can kind of get into a little bit of a dangerous spot where you're trying to be too true to the flavor for the card that you're making. And you kind of put yourself into a, a little bit of a design hole of, well, how do I make this card balanced? Because obviously, you know, being the big headliner card, I would, you know, we, we would, you know, I'm sure the designers would really like this card to see play. But if they make the card too good, then all of a sudden it's everywhere, and now it's a problem because it's just way too good. And I, I, I wonder how how might they go about like doing balancing checks on that? Obviously, people aren't real big fans of you know when these cards come out and they just get hit with the ban hammer, and it's like, well, great, now now it's not usable at all. So, and any thoughts on on what they might do in that space? Uh, I think they get themselves into like tunnel vision where they, I feel like the designers have a very specific intention on how we're supposed to play the game. And then we as players do the complete exact opposite, ignore everything that they say and they want us to do and just do our own thing. Sometimes it's a little too railroady. Like I play a lot of red hybrids. Um, there's not a lot of wiggle space inside of the deck because the deck is fairly mostly self-contained on how it wants to function as a whole. I think they did a really good job at that. And to say that Red Hybrids is one of the most fair decks in the game is uh, kind of sad because it's still doing a lot of things that other decks just wish they could even do in terms of being able to pump out uh, its overall game plan. And I think they just... Sometimes they just don't know when to pump the brake and really limit something in terms of the design that they're trying to do and when they want to go absolutely balls to the walls crazy on what they could potentially do. Like Greymon from BT17 as uh, another example is just a really wonky card in terms of what you can actually do with it. I don't know if any of it is like actually going to be competitive. We'll see from Japan in like a couple of weeks on how good that's going to end up being. But when this card was first released, we all looked at it and we're just like, excuse me, like we're getting how much value off of this card? Uh, and it's quite a lot. And like for anyone who doesn't know what the card does, basically you could digivolve it on top of an Agumon. It's a Greymon. No brainer. It's a white Greymon though. And the interesting thing is if this Digimon, uh, like the Digimon's name actually counts as everything that's underneath him. So like if it has Koromon in its inheritable source, then it gains plus 3000. Um, and then during all turns, its name is all of the Digimon underneath it. So it's also an Agumon on top of being a Greymon, partially because the movie that it was from Ty kept calling Greymon Agumon because he didn't exactly understand the concept that his Digimon changed, even though it physically changed. But that was like a little lore tidbit from the movie. But we obviously can break this in several different ways because now it's treated as an Agumon, which means other Greymon can Digivolve on top of it. And now we're getting into some like, oh, what can, like, how can we break this card in half? Because they went a little bit too loose on the flavor and the restrictions. Yeah, I, I can definitely see where that could get a little bit of hairy. I definitely know in the process of designing, you know, when you're designing stuff in a, you know, kind of a, a, a sealed space in your mind, it's like, oh, well, if I give this card this effect, obviously it will benefit it in these very uh, finite ways. I think in the process of designing, I think sometimes you get a little too tunnel vision on how how little very very small things like that can make very big and potentially very scary <laughs> things to happen because uh, it's hard sometimes when you have a very large card base i know to take into account everything else that's come before it because you're kind of designing in this limited space you're designing for the new sets you know, so you're thinking, oh, well, I have these 150 cards that are going to be in this particular set, and they'll have these interactions, and you'll probably have that baseline knowledge of, okay, I, I know what the last, like, maybe three or four sets had, so I kind of know what some potentiality is here. And like you said, 
when the designers are testing it, they are going to test it a certain way. When the players get their hands on this card, they're going to do it, you know, they might do it in a very similar way. They could do it in just absolutely bonker, crazy things that the designers start scratching their heads. They're just like, well, dang, how the heck did they come up with these? We, we, we didn't even think about this as a potentiality, which I think definitely lends itself nicely to the idea of how much flavor do you put into something like that without causing it to be potentially a game-breaking mechanic. And I think that's a very uh, fair point on just where is that line and how do you even draw it to begin with? Because for me, with Apocalymon, the easiest thing is you just don't have it interact with anything outside of Dark Masters. But for whatever reason, again, they probably got tunnel visioned. Uh, they didn't do that. Or the inverse, they already knew it was coming down the pipeline and they needed it to not be hard locked because it interacts with something later. So, because it's no secret that designers don't design like the set right before it. Like right now, they're not working on sets uh 18 in japan because 17 just came out they already have sets 18 probably 19 and 20 already done those are already designed and being tested and printed uh and changed and like they have that knowledge because not only do they have to think what's behind it but they also have to think what's in front of it which is why like when we get certain bands like all the way back in bt6 when we got the uh Jessmon ban on Savior Huck being limited to one, it's because they already knew the starter deck was going to be coming out and that card was going to have like some really powerful interactions with the starter deck, maybe more powerful than what they would have thought or wanted based on how we were using it and the success it was having. Uh, granted, that wasn't exactly the reality, but that's something they have to think about that we don't necessarily even acknowledge at times. Well, and it definitely could lend some credence, too, when people see, perhaps, like you said, if set 19 comes out and they see a particular card, and it's like, well, oh, Jesus Christ, why did they print this card? They already know that this is just going to make this this particular deck power spike, and it's definitely because of the reasons you said. This set very well could have already, you know, it's already probably designed. It might be in the final phases of testing and getting ready finalization for print, and by the time that they're aware of a particular deck that this card is going to affect being problematic as it is, and they see the reasons why, and then they look at this card that's going to be coming up, and they're like, oh, we messed up. That's why I think you definitely would see, when you see those, see these cards, it's just like, ah, dang, what, what were the designers thinking? And sometimes, I know in some card games, there are some preemptive bans. I mean, the sets hardly come out, and they're just like, yeah, you uh, this card's banned. You, you can't use it in this particular deck. Yeah, and it's not just a Digimon problem. Other card games have done that, too. But uh, where Digimon is interesting is because they're taking a lot of their effects from the lore, some of it actually could be, like, fixed before they even get to that state. Um, like, granted, not everything is going to be one-to-one -one accurate with the lore, uh, just because, like, colors impact, like, what the Digimon is supposed to do. Uh, then you also just have, like, what the Digimon's character is trying to do with the evolutionary line that they're going for based on, you know, the reference that they're trying to make. So, like, uh, BT-12... Agumon is supposed to be the version of Tai that we see in the um, Boy Who Leapt Through Time season of the anime, where that Agumon is obviously different than the Agumon that we got in BT-15, which is based off of uh, the very first adventure series. So you do kind of get like a little bit of different flavoring based on the where they're pulling their inspiration from and how they're designing cards and to interact with one another. Cause you see like metal Greymon ACE, that's a very bland, very generic card. It's doing nothing special, but that's because the focus isn't necessarily on that card. 
it's more focused on the interaction between Tai, Greymon, Agumon, and War Greymon. Just because towards the end of the anime, he starts warp digivolving into War Greymon quite a lot, which is why the War Greymon has that warp ability. So you get some really interesting like play lines that they're trying to design based on the evolutionary line, based on the reference. And some of it obviously could be avoided by toning down the cards, but they also have to meet a specific power threshold in order for that card to be desirable. Well, and definitely in the term of, you know, if you're seeing a War Greymon, you're very well aware, like, you know, War Greymon's a pretty strong Digimon. Obviously, you know, he fuses with Metal Garurumon, can make Omnimon. You're not going to make an Omnimon card that's just some generic, like, 20k beater. I mean... You could, but are people going to be real happy about a kind of card like that? It's like, you know, this is Omnimon. This is, you know, a very special Digimon. It's got a lot of, you know, connotation carried behind that name. So you want to make something that feels like it belongs to that card. You could just make it a big beater. Omnimon's a really strong Digimon. Is it going to be very one-to-one with, you know what people are expecting, given the what they know from the anime, eh, not so much. Yeah, and to that point, like, we already know that we're going to be getting more Omnimon support in um, BT-17, because that's the big movie set, and this is where they're retrofitting cards to modern stuff, because... Uh, the idea on how you're supposed to play the Omnimon deck, at least based on what they're trying to tell me from the cards inside of BT-17, is you're supposed to warp from your Agumon into your uh, War Greymon in order to then DNA with Omnimon, or into Omnimon. Uh, and that allows a card like BT-14, War Greymon, which has a warp ability to be something to actually consider as part of that deck. And that only exists because of the flavoring. And even just how mechanics just function in the game, like between DNA, like we've seen like Yu-Gi-Oh do synchros and that's like a similar enough of a concept, but in terms of what it means for Digimon, it's a little bit different and especially how they're treating DNAs, let alone um, ace DNA where it is requiring two very specific Digimon in order to use it for even more highs. So it does require more setup, but because it requires more setup, because of the flavoring on how they want the card to work, you get a much better effect as a result when you could actually utilize it. All right, so basically they're making the mechanics a little bit more tricky in terms of the interaction, you know, you mentioned Yu-Gi-Oh! Synchro is pretty generic. I just have to make sure that these, you know, this tuner to non-tuner, the stars just equal up to the number they're supposed to be. And bam, I can just I just play the card. Yeah, and Whereas, same thing with like Exceeds, where it's the same type of concept. Line up the numbers, bam, get a new card. <laughs> but then you have like the really old like combination versions in Yu-Gi-Oh! where it was fusion monsters. You needed this very specific card and this other very specific card. And then they would combine to make this other very specific card. I don't know. I don't really follow the Yu-Gi-Oh! scene, but in in the terms of mechanics, I would imagine something that requires two very specific things in order to make the interaction happen to have a much better payoff than something that just requires generic, generic combine. Don't think that's always the case in a lot of games, but... Uh, no, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about generic cards. The more generic the card is, like, oddly enough, the better it is. And, like, that's kind of true for a lot of card games, and that's what makes staples, you know, staples. And I think Digimon is starting with having some really good generic cards, but I think, like, right now, based on the current pacing and how cards are being designed and styled, I think that's part of what's causing tempo issues is because they're designing these cards to be interacting in a very specific way based on the flavor and now here comes something that's breaking that flavor or kind of enhancing the flavor to an unhealthy level when it comes to actual game balance 
Right, because then you could get the uh, the weird interactions of you have a deck that is very structurally designed to be very aggro, but then you have a whole bunch of cards that are supposed to be support for this particular archetype or deck, and none of them seem to support the same goal for the deck. They're a little too niche in their interactions and what they're supposed to be adding to the deck. And all of a sudden, this once aggro style deck now becomes, you know, significantly slower and almost becomes maybe like a mid range because of the support. And then I guess then the question comes on to the player. Is the support good enough to completely change the play style of your deck? Or is it just better to pretend that this new support doesn't exist and just keep doing what you're doing, or maybe take one or two cards that just generically, you know, are better than something you already have and just fit into a slot. And we do see that a lot, just as a couple of examples. Gallimon is like the big offender, where he's just like, I'm all about using my abilities to delete your Digimon. And then all of a sudden, he's just like, no, 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 no. I'm now about raid and DP boosting myself, and then I gain extra benefits for you not having anything on the field. So it's still like kind of borrowing the idea on getting rid of the opponent's Digimon. It's just doing it completely different, using completely different support tools. And it's just like, well, what do I... Like, it does create a little bit of confusion based on the the tonal shifts that they're trying to do. And Ragnar Lordmon, bless whoever's trying to make those decks work... Um, the new stuff from EX6 wants almost nothing to do with almost any of the old stuff. So it's like they're completely replacing what it's trying to do while still maintain what the core identity of what the card in what the deck is. And I feel like that causes like causes a lot more confusion and headache for the players to be able to try to figure out those card combinations on what's the new stuff doing versus what's the old stuff doing and what do I want to try to prioritize? Well, and then it also lends itself to are these changes being made in the name of trying to balance a certain archetype? Are they trying to rein in how aggressive this aggro deck is? Because it's just killing everybody by turn three or turn four, which Maybe there's a, you know, I'm sure there's a subset of players that are like, yeah, I hate aggro decks. I, I, I want the game to last a little bit longer. So maybe the designers at that case are foregoing a little bit of the flavor for these particular cards, mixing it up, like you said, with Gallantmon to change how a particular deck is being played to make it more balanced, while at the same time sacrificing that flavor that the cards would you would expect them to have, especially if they've already made like a pre-establish of, hey, this is what the card is doing when it gets introduced, and then five sets later, they print a new version of it, and it's like, these are completely incompatible cards. Yeah, and I think Purple is probably the biggest defender of that, because a lot of their cards are just straight-up generic tools, and Purple as a color is just basically generic dot deck on how do you want to fill up your trash and how is the deck going to be utilizing the trash it has almost nothing to do with the actual digimon itself it's just trying to play the best of whatever it can because everything just works with one another because of how much things are overlapping with it and that's what's making like this whole purple imbalance like absolutely through the roof and why we get stuff like Anubismon where it actually needs to get like the problem is so big that they have no choice but to hit the actual problem instead of cards around the problem which is what they generally try to do to be able to make as many things playable as they possibly can is like okay we're not going to hit the problem you could still use that big spicy explosive card but we're going to hit some cards to either hurt its consistency or hurt its speed. Just slow it down by some way, shape, or form. But Purple was so out of control that they had actually no choice but to hit the problematic cards because of how many different moving parts and pieces it had. Because a lot of it just did lack that color, or not really color identity, those uh, flavor identities that it kind of is supposed to have. You do have a little bit, but not a whole lot. 
I guess based on that, would you be willing to say that in the current meta where it stands right now, purple suffers somewhat from a flavor identity where purple doesn't really have a lot of flavor to the decks that it's building or the Digimon within the decks themselves. And it's more just, we have a bunch of generic cards that we're just going to max, we're just going to take the absolute max value of everything we can just cram into this deck. And it, it just, it just works. And th there's nothing you can do about it. And all the other colors just can't really compete because they're more focused on the flavor aspect of their decks rather than just being generic good card. I I actually think that's a huge portion of it. Like looking at all of like the recent successes Purple had and all of the limitations that Purple has been under, like the only actual flavor coming out of Purple is the level six bomb Digimon, like the game finishers themselves. That's where all of the flavor is condensed into, and usually when they do it, it's incredibly strong. Uh, like Beelzemon as an example, just to kind of start rounding things off and like start this discussion. Uh, he's a Demon Lord. Demon Lord like having 10 cards in their trash. Uh, he's all about mill. His deck wants to do nothing but support the fact that you're milling your cards. That's why a lot of those cards have just really good generic uh, when this card is milled, do X effect. Well, Myotismon, even though he's like a worse deck, he wants to mill too. So he's going to use all of those same exact tools Except the the flavor is going to be, the setup is going to be a little bit differently, but he's essentially accomplishing the same goal. That's why you don't see a whole lot of Belfmon players versus Leviamon players is because, oh, I'm just trying to fill up my trash with some very specific cards, have a setup that you literally cannot interact with, and then once it comes to my turn... I'm just going to blow everything up on your field and then just punch you really hard. Both decks are doing almost the exact same thing, utilizing draw and discard as the primary ways to set up. Granted, they're doing it a little bit differently because uh, Belfmon actually does have more flavor going on with him using the Gizamon stuff, but Leviamon's just adopting everything that was broken about Anubis and just abusing it again, but differently. So, like... It, it It is really condensed into the level 6s, and the level 3s through um, level 5 are all hyper-generic on um, just trying to support how it's trying to fill the trash the most efficient way for the deck. Right, and it would be in stark contrast to a deck more like Black War Greymon or a War Greymon deck where you are 100% expecting to see a very large quantity of you know, the Agumon evolution line getting up to these, you know, to your to your level six cards. It You know, you're not going to say, oh, you know, I have my Agumon and, you know, here's my generic champion who's just arguably, he's just numbers-wise better than anything else I could throw here. The cards at the top are going to benefit from the fact that you're doing the, the proper ride line in flavor because it's going to give you a lot of a, a lot of bonus once you get to the top where it sounds like the the purple decks it, it doesn't really matter what's at the bottom it's just a whole matter of hey i i just have mechanics these cards have the mechanics that i need i can literally change out the top end of this deck maybe a few support cards here or there and i can just literally make anything i want but i'm going to basically make every deck with this core of just say 20 cards. These 20 cards are going to be in every single purple deck just because they're that good. Is and it on flavor for those decks? Maybe, maybe not. But it's a numbers game at that point, not so much flavor. Yeah, and Bandai definitely knew they headed down that direction with purple, which is why we got a lot of like core purple cards just completely uh, limited because of that exact reason. Where it's just like, yeah, there's no reason for me not to use these core 20 cards or whatever, or like these just generically good cards that just do nothing but accelerate my game plan a little too well. And that that is exactly the reason why they got limited, is just because it 
limited what they can make because now they have to make a card to compete with that. But if they were to make a card to compete with that, do they make it more restricted and flavorful to that deck? Or do they start opening it up and just say everything can use it? And I feel like that's part of the pitfall that they don't exactly seem to know how to navigate is when to hold back and make things more limited and restricted or when they should open things up and let everything do whatever they want especially when it comes to some of the more staple option cards that they keep introducing because that completely changes the way that we approach the game especially when decks at the end of the day are basically like fighting game characters in my opinion they're basically just trying to fulfill a role or function on the overall play style and approach to the deck. I want to play an aggro deck. Cool. I'm playing red hybrids. Um, I'm want to play like, that's probably like the equivalent of like your classic Shoto well-rounded more in your face, but can do some controlling type stuff in the back as well. Uh, then you get your like combo characters, which are basically like your charger stance characters uh, I know I'm kind of like grasping at straws here for fighting game analogies, um, but you have your, like your control type characters, which is going to be arranged, and it's really just finding what uh, flavor impacts the play style, which impacts your decision to play that deck. Right, and in the terms of the player base, in your honest opinion... Do you think a lot of the player base cares about the flavor of the deck they're playing? Or is it more of, oh, this deck is doing really good in the meta. I'm just going to go ahead and build it. It doesn't matter to me what cards I'm putting in there per se. I just want a deck that works well. I actually think looking at the meta, most people just care about the functionality of the deck and what it can do for the current environment. Because Digimon whether Bandai likes to admit it or not, wants to try to be a competitive card game. Uh, Bandai, for whatever reason, wants to hamper it from actually being taken seriously as a competitive card game. Um, and I think that's very disingenuous of Bandai, but based on how they're treating some of the card designs and like focusing more on flavor than balance at times, makes me believe that way. But the community definitely is more... Uh, driven to be more competitive by nature of just card games. Granted, a lot of people, when they're first starting out with Digimon, we always say, pick whatever Digimon you like. Because at the end of the day, that's what people are going to gravitate to uh, on a more casual level, which any game wants to have its casuals. So it's like, I think Digimon, because of that, is catering very well to the casuals because we have a lot of Digimon being represented in the game that is their favorite. I know you, uh, as an example, when you were first starting, you were just like, make me uh, a Metal Seedramon deck. And I'm just like, all right, I got you, fam. Aegis Dramon it is. He plays out Metal Seedramon for free. It's super cool. Uh, is that deck anywhere near meta competitive? No. But can you have a good time with that deck? Yeah. You want to play something a little bit more competitive, you could swap to your other favorite, which is War Greymon, uh, or Black War Greymon, and now you're talking, okay, I'm getting up there in terms of competitive scope, but uh, for whatever reason right now, Black War Greymon is kind of struggling a little bit. So if you were to try to play a more similar control type deck, if you were actually wanted to take yourself as a serious competitor, you would probably just end up playing Leviamon for that same type of role. Right. And I definitely would agree with that sentiment. If you have something that you enjoy, it might not be very good, but if it's what gets you into the game and it has that flavor there that you are looking to expect from playing a deck built around a specific Digimon, it, uh, in my opinion, that is what gets you excited of, oh, you know, I, I want to play more matches. I, I might not have the best deck in the world, but am I having a good time? And I think uh, for the casual players, that's what gets them in, you know, gets that foot in the door is the, if I'm having a good time, I might not necessarily be winning all the time, but, you know, there's always that that particular slope of uh, I need to understand how my deck works and then I need to understand the matchups that I'm coming up against. And I think at a certain point, 
the casual player can then make their decision of, do I want to try and be more competitive with this game? Do I want to go for a build or a deck in particular that has more meta options? It has that performance capacity that perhaps my first deck or my preferred Digimon just simply, it, it's not there for them. And on that note, perhaps, since we've been talking about purple kind of shifting towards this more generic kind of feel to it, do you think that perhaps the designers might do that with more of the colors, where they will shift away from the more flavorful, uh, lore-inspired kind of decks, like the War Grame on Black War Grame on decks, and sh- you know shift all of the colors more to this? You know, it doesn't really necessarily need to be flavor. Here are your generic, just good cards, and you just put in you know whatever condensed flavor you want into the deck. Uh, unfortunately, I actually don't think that's even remotely possible at this point. Um, as much as I kind of would want like some uh, generic tools to be able to form like a toolbox out of not all of the colors have the amount of cross synergy to make that work like purple does. The next best color that could do that is yellow because for whatever reason, they're so high on yellow vaccines being a thing and all of the best yellow cards are spoiler alert vaccines that it it just it's yellow is hitting those same type of notes, but they're limited to just vaccines. But you know, if all their best cards are already that it kind of just doesn't matter. Uh, and this is kind of why, like, me and apparently a lot of the community want, uh, BT14 Patamon banned or limited is because he's doing the exact same things that, uh, Jet Silphimon did, uh, before Patamon, which was homogenize yellow to basically be, are you playing Patamon? Yes. You're a, you're a viable yellow deck. Are you not playing Patamon? No, you're not viable. And I think that's pretty sad that yellow vaccines basically just is eating away at the color yellow and kind of stripping it, not necessarily of its identity, because you get a lot of flavorful stuff in there. It's just it ruins a lot of the value proposition to play anything else. And that's kind of the problem that Purple's facing, where it's just like, oh, I have to play this deck because it's just the best at uh, and these tools, because it's the best at cycling through its deck, setting itself up, and doing everything it needs to. Like, there was actually borderline zero reason to ever think about playing um, Lugamon when you had Anubis as a deck, because they were doing almost the exact same thing. I'm going to flood the field as fast as I possibly can. I have good control, offense, and defensive tools, except Anubismon did it better and faster and required less setup because its setup was on the way up. So, like, Fenrir Lugamon needs to set up its trash, which it can't do while digivolving, where Anubismon did it all in one, which is what made it overperform to begin with. Oh, in your words, some of the colors you feel are pretty safe from this generic overload that purple kind of has felt itself overtaken by, where the design of most of their cards kind of is limited to the fact that they kind of have to maintain that flavor approach to them, whereas they, they can't really slot out any of the flavor or quote-unquote generic good stuff because quote-unquote generic good stuff just isn't good enough to replace what's already there exactly uh like mirage is probably a really good example or i guess blue hybrids is probably a better example of this where like until the bt17 stuff comes around with the next wave of support blue hybrids literally you are just trying to play with the best blue cards you have available while playing inside of uh you know your little engine so it's just like you have your base tamer you have your base hybrids and then your level six could kind of just be whatever the heck you want it to be uh your supporting level five also could technically be whatever you want it to be most people just use an ace because of their low play costs the fact that you're playing mostly off of your level fours and the more level five aces that they introduce the more flexible that slot can actually be because right now we only have two of them and one of them is a very clear better answer than the other one but like 
that's a deck where it just plays to whatever low end and top end best support each other and the engine itself. And not a lot of colors have a deck that it can do that with, which really does, uh, I guess, limit its overall success because most colors are more archetypical. And in that build sense, a lot of those decks require highly specific support in order for them to make any gains in the new meta. If, you know, we're using Wargreymon as an example quite often, or at least I am, because it's the one I'm most familiar with being very archetypical. Obviously, you know, uh, my Wargreymon deck isn't going to make any major differences until, you know, a new Greymon comes out. It's like, well, is this new Greymon good enough to replace any of the ones that I currently have? Okay, no? Okay, then I guess we're going to wait for the next round of support and hopefully we get it. But I think, as from a design standpoint, that can also be kind of tricky because you have, you can have so many different archetypes in a game and if you are relying on highly specific archetypes in order to uh, put forward more support then as a designer it's it gets a little trickier because it's like well how often do i put out new support for you know these particular archetypes because they're expecting these very specific cards and and then it's like well what's the point of building these generic cards you know if, Obviously, they may, one for one, be a much better card than what this deck is looking for, but because the deck gets so much extra value from the card that's already here, how does this generic good support compete with it? At what point can we make cards that are outside of the archetype that are just good, you can just put them in any deck? And then, you know, it also then, again, runs back into the same point of if that slowly becomes the norm of just generic good stuff taking the place of the archetypes, then what happens to the flavor of my archetypes? That That is a very good point, because uh, going back to Mirage as an example, we have a whole bunch of Gao-based cards. But right now, the deck is actually not 100% Gao-based, because for what the deck is doing, some it needs to sacrifice some of those that flavor for function, and that like because we lost the uh, Bukamon egg that had jamming, so we need to have jamming in other ways. So right now we're just using it as a rookie, and we know in BT sixteen we get a inline an in archetype um, Digimon on the level four that gives us jamming. So now we could swap that out. Uh, in order to put something else back in, like the Gomamons, because now we have jamming somewhere else that we could rely on. But that does affect the overall end stack in terms of what is my desired stack going to look like, how is my deck going to combo off, and uh, like how is that going to affect its overall performance. Because the consistency goes down when you play off archetype, and you don't have the proper supports to be able to uh, make it work. Blue can get away with that because of just how many good cards allow it to draw and cycle through itself in order to find its not archetype pieces when you're using more archetype searchers. And that's kind of where the generic cards of like training boosts come in. Um, like the training cards and the memory boosts because they're looking more specifically for colors, not for archetypes. So you can afford a little bit of a consistency dip with your Digimon because you can make that up in other areas. The consequences of that is just the overall shift in play pattern style where now I'm just looking at purely functionality. I'm going to use these cards to dig out the exact functional pieces that I need and sit there, do nothing until I'm ready to move out and combo off. So there's, there's some pros and cons to it in terms of what you can sacrifice for flavor and for function and for balance. Oh, and it goes to the question at the very start of the thing, you know, they're kind of constantly in flux at a certain point, you know, flavor is fighting against the balance. If something is becoming too flavorable or in some cases, not really any flavor at all, it can adversely or inversely affect the balance of these particular cards. I mean, 
Black War Greymon many sets ago, I recall, at one point in time, people had considered it a tier zero deck. Extremely flavorful deck. You know, you got your, you know, your very rigid ride, you know, your very rigid stack that's going to be, a, you know, your Agamon, Greymon, Metal Greymon, you know, all the way up. And then, you know, at current we have, you know, the, the purple decks like Anubismon where there's not really a whole lot of flavor going on there. It's just very condensed into like a very small subsect of cards, but in in the general sense, there's just a lot of generic supporting it. So it, it's interesting to see that you can kind of have it both ways where not enough flavor and too much flavor can kind of cause uh, an imbalance in how balanced these uh, these decks can be. And I think that's part of like what makes Digimon a really interesting game because, uh, like I said at the beginning, I can't really sit there and think of any other card game that actually is using lore to design mechanics and using the mechanics to influence other aspects and areas of the game on top of just having good generic well-rounded stuff like a lot of people are really confused with uh the color pie of digimon and i basically say there really isn't a color pie um like each of the colors kind of influences a different area but we're at a point where colors are kind of influencing almost every area uh because you have something like red hybrids which is a red deck which generally is more uh battlefield focused and it's a deck that also uses the trash. You have Numimon, which is a black deck, which black is generally supposed to impact and influence the deck itself. But it's also borrowing a little bit of yellow, so it has some DP- as its control, a little bit of recovery, on top of the fact that it also can use the trash. And you start to get these like really weird amalgamations of like, oh, these cross colors allow you to use different avenues and explore different design spaces but at what cost well and then you could also talk about uh, to an extent we've been primarily talking about the flavor of the, uh, the 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 lore that we have with digimon transferring over to the card game itself but you could also bring into the conversation a little bit to the flavor that each color brings to the table obviously uh, something that seem makes uh, you know, factions in a card game appealing is when each faction is doing something very specific to that faction itself. Uh, I know in Digimon, uh, yellow is very heavy on interacting with the uh, the security, and purple is very heavy on milling itself, so it can do some crazy interactions with the drop. And I think that element is also very important in determining the flavor, because that's what gives a little bit of a draw to a particular color. It's like, oh, well, if I want to, uh, you know, I want to have plenty of control over my security, which is effective my eye health, I, I'm going to gravitate towards yellow. It, it would start to feel kind of weird, I guess, in my mind, if all of a sudden blue and green, for whatever reason, started getting a lot of security interaction. It's like, well, that was kind of yellow's thing, but now they're doing it too, what's my incentive to continue using yellow when I could just use one of these two other colors? That That's a very valid point, because we did see a lot of decks just want to, for whatever reason, interact with the trash outside of purple. Uh, like Red Hybrids, Numemon does it. Uh, obviously, almost every purple deck does it. Like, literally every purple deck and, like, what's supposed to help decide and differentiate the decks is the flavor that is going on on top of the mechanical identity. Do you want to draw and discard or do you want to mill? I want to mill myself and have a good time at the RNG aspect of what's going to come off the top. Cool. Beelzemon is your deck. You want to draw and discard? There's zero reason not to play Leviamon um, unless you just don't like Leviamon. Then you could go back and play Belfmon or something like that. So I, I kind of get where you're coming from, where having, like, Digimon doesn't have a hardcore color pie on what each color is supposed to do because of how archetypical they made the game and how much cross-color synergy and support 
influences the design because usually when you see a two color card it tries to take aspects of both colors so like shine graymon's a really good example of this where it's just like i want to dp reduce and delete low dp amounts so i'm dp reducing to get you into those low dp thresholds then i'm also playing with the security as well as just being able to interact with the field too so like you do get lots of different elements from both of the colors that it's trying to pull from and i think in order to like course correct some of those um they could do something like what they're doing with bt17 where shine graymon gets more support but it's all yellow. I mean, granted, it's still all name-based evolution, which is in archetype, and you could basically ignore colors, which I think is a another kind of slight oversight on the overall design of the game because of name-based evolution allowing you to ignore colors. It creates more opportunities for both broken stuff and like fun and interesting things that they didn't exactly think of. Right. And on the topic of the, the two color cards, I mean, that would be completely what I would expect. Uh, if I have a card that is of two different colors, obviously I'm expecting that particular card to draw from both of those colors, particular flavor. And obviously you'll have both, you know, cards of just the mono color, which will be supporting, you know, theoretically both both sides as well for whatever type of deck that you're trying to build. I mean, you wouldn't be building a red deck that's focused on milling yourself out and pulling stuff out of the drop. I mean, red has some of those options, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think interactions with certain zones is definitely something that the colors should all have access to, but maybe to a limited extent, obviously, you know, say, you know, you discard something out of your hand or... A Digimon gets wiped off the field, and it's like, ah, oh, crap. Um, that there goes a major piece of what I need. I could potentially rebuild from my hand at relatively low cost, but I'm missing one particular piece, and it's like, well, my only option is to start and just pray to God that I draw it out of my deck, and it's not stuck in security somewhere. But it would be, you know, very advantageous to me for a, a tempo. To be able to just be like, oh, well, I just need to do one particular pull from drop. It's not what my color does, but it helps keep me on tempo without screwing me over too hard if I make a slight misstep. And I think, like, looking ahead into the future meta, that's kind of like the sentiment a lot of people had with uh, Rapid Bond, just as an example, in the armor decks, because you have Rapid Bond and Magnamon as the two premier armor decks, because both of them get a new uh, armor card to interact with, with uh, a brand new three color Magnamon X and a brand new level six Rapid Bond X that's also two colors. But because it's two colors, now you could choose between do I want to play green base or do I want to play a uh, a yellow base for Rapid Bond more specifically. And then because I'm playing armors, I could just throw in Magnamon because Magnamon cares about armors. And like that's how you get some really interesting deck compositions. But in terms of like actual game balance, that's also how you like halfway break the game because now you just have an amalgamation of the best tools utilizing a particular package or engine and uh based on the color that you're playing with and with the gururumon x stuff they definitely had a huge problem with that where uh gururumon x almost killed off two completely like two complete colors because its draw engine was the best and its discard engine was also the best. So because it was taking aspects from both colors and basically breaking it in half, it almost ruined two functional colors as a result, um, which is both funny and sad. So there's, it's very hard to find a fine line because the designers obviously thought that, oh, this is a Garurumon card. Nobody's going to play it in outside of Garurumon decks, right? No. Everyone played it because the functionality of the card was too good for whatever it was trying to whatever the deck was trying to accomplish it reminds me of the the one particular deck i remember you telling me about it was a uh, if i remember correctly wasn't it a lilith mon deck that 
The Lilithon Lilith. was Yeah, the the Milith the Milithmon deck where Lilithon was literally just there as a resource engine and that that was literally the whole reason she was there and it's like she she, she just works. Yeah, because they're just abusing the purple Gilmon stuff to try to mill both players out. And then uh, Lilithmon, like you said, was just the resource engine value piece to be able to uh, refresh yourself in terms of the combo potential that that card is providing for the deck. Because you could just use the tempo that she's gaining to then play more cards, to then uh, reset yourself into a particular state to turbo mill the opponent out in uh, a big combo turn because of the delay options which she also kind of interacts with on being able to bring back different options so yeah it's there there is just a very fine line between like how you want to make something flavorful and how you want to make something generic and i feel like digimon is really good at making things flavorful and really bad at making things generic. And when I mean, like, really bad at making things generic, I mean, when they do, half the time it's, like, borderline broken. It's, like, either unplayable or broken. It's it's one of those things where there there is no in-between. It's either we're going full steam ahead or we're, we're, we're backing up as fast as we can go. Yeah, there's, there's actually rarely an in, in-between. And I think that's both funny and sad at the same time. And they're supposed to be like this new director, and maybe this new director is going to help fix some of those issues. Um, I don't know. I don't know where the old director left off in terms of set design. It obviously is not with BT-15 being their big colossal mistake. Um, it probably, like, I, knowing how game design works and after working on a card game myself... Um, it probably the rest of this year is their design, like the old designer's design, and the new designer is going to pick up in the next block, which is going to be block four. Um, and I don't necessarily hate everything that the old designer did because obviously he gave us aces and aces gave us more interactions, but, uh, they also gave us delay, which has borderline zero interaction and zero ways to interact with it. So the, for every good, there's some bad. And hopefully this new designer can definitely course correct in terms of the actual hardcore design of the game. Because right now, in my perspective, I made a whole big video of it. The biggest problem that I'm having with the game isn't the flavor. It isn't necessarily the balance so much. It's just the design of specific cards that just are astronomically broken for how good and generic they are and maybe that was because they put too much flavor into it and they didn't limit it or the inverse uh not enough flavor and it made the card too open so uh but i do think that when it comes to the big design aspects of the game i like what it's doing I just think that they have some pitfalls that they work themselves into and they don't know how to work themselves out of. Well, and on the mention of the new, a new designer coming in, I would expect to see some some very experimental things perhaps with the uh, the next coming year because uh, obviously the you know the new designer could definitely keep things the way they are with how the old designer set everything up. I mean, we have what, four years of cards that have been designed, and I'm sure that they've pretty much followed some sort of design Bible on how they're putting all of these cards together. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if the new designer will be keeping with that, or, like you said, if they're really going to try and shake things up. And I would expect to see a lot of... Uh, a lot of experimental things being thrown out if they want to shake things up. A lot of things that the players might be concerned of like man this is just absolute trash why would they even put this out a perfect example would be in magic when they introduced a uh, megamorph a lot of the players saw this mechanic and were just like why is this a thing why would anybody even bother like using this mechanic it's terrible or you know they could come out with something that's just absolutely broken and it could be very well on flavor for what's you know what it's being attached to but it's just 
way too good for the design space of where all of the cards already have been. Uh, and in fact, I, yeah, well, yeah, that would be a perfectly good example there. It's uh, very <laughs> powerful, <laughs> very, no, very dangerous. Nobody likes Infect. Yeah, I wouldn't say nobody likes it. There, there's definitely people that do, but it definitely has a very, uh, it leaves a very bad taste in most of uh, the Magic players' mouths if they have had the joy of interacting with a particularly toxic uh, Infect deck. But on the on the point that I was making of the design changes, I think you'll see the designer perhaps trying new things to see where he can push the uh, the design space to, and you know there might be success there, there might be failure, and I would expect after a year of trying and testing out these, uh, you know, putting those feelers out on where they can expand on it or how they can try and change this the design space up a little bit, then you, after a, a year. The next year later, you might start to see some more solidification of these ideas coming to fruition, uh, having a lot better balance, you know, actually seeing a lot of these new mechanics perhaps being introduced into the meta and being relevant. Um, it, it, it'll be interesting to see for sure. Yeah, and they definitely have... Uh... Liberators, which is something brand new. Like, technically, Seekers was also brand new, and that gave us Mind Link. So they're using, they're finding new ways to tell new stories and give us new mechanics to interact with these new forms of media because Seekers is a, uh, a web novel of sorts, and Liberators is a web uh, comic. And those are two unique stories, and the TCG has been out, and maybe they decided to take the Pokemon approach, where it's just like, hey, uh, we know we're going to be making cards for the, for the TCG, and therefore that gives them an excuse to have some interesting mechanics to be able to play around with. And I think... Like, that's what makes Digimon so unique of an IP in a card game is because they could leverage everything that they have and everything that they're going to be making. And I think that, like you said, we're probably going to see some more experimental stuff when unification happens. And I think that is going to be the most important year in Digimon TCG's, like, lifespan. Uh, if they mess up what comes after unification... That's going to have some major ramifications on the game. And right now, we're going through a lot of like event growing pains when it comes to trying to support the competitive side. Because people just want avenues to be able to play the game because of how fun it is. And when Bandai is limiting it and denying us, or like it feels like they're denying us, they're not really. They're just limiting what they're giving us. It really puts a sour taste in our mouth when you see them focus on some other stuff because their resources are just spread too thin, even though, yes, they probably have a division for each different game, um, not every place has a different division for each different game. So, like, Top Cut, Core, Carta Magica, they only have so much manpower and resources to put towards creating that competitive environment, and they can only support so many different things. And when Bandai's saying, hey, here's, like, 10 card games, support all of them, on a weekly basis like there's there's no possible way they can do that and like that's that's getting into something completely different but uh getting back on track like they have a lot to prove in the next two years in order to cement the game as one of the greatest card games that they have ever made um and like i know one piece is their love child and one piece is doing incredibly well uh but I think what Digimon is doing for what it is, to me, is just a way better and more interesting game. Well, on that topic, I mean, One Piece is one of their newer games, so being a newer game, I'm sure that they're putting a lot more support behind it to help build that particular community, whereas Digimon's a little bit older. The community there is pretty well, you know, fairly well established, I would think more so than, than One Piece, so they're trying to give a little bit more support out to something that's newer to help draw more people in. Once that's kind of you know solidified itself to a little bit, to some extent, 
then they'll probably draw some of the resources back out. They might spread them around, you know, reallocate them. But I, I wanted to go back to, to the point that you're talking about, um, liberators. Uh, we were talking about flavor in the card, uh, flavor in the game, and you know, uh, almost all the cards in the game currently are pulling from the lore based on the anime, the movies. But liberators is it's uh, is a whole new thing. It's it's a lot. It it would be similar to what we talked about earlier, where a lot of card games are building the lore and they're drawing from that as they go, which they definitely would have that opportunity with Liberators. So would you expect to see a lot more generic support coming out of anything associated to Liberators? As far as what we, what little we have seen, because there is a Chapter Zero, and uh we kind of know like some splash images and uh we did get some promos and they're starting to leak some of the starter deck cards which that doesn't exactly tell a whole lot outside of what the the two main characters are gonna like their digimon are gonna have in terms of a baseline abilities um i think that they are going to have the opportunity to be able to do something they haven't done before because of liberators or something they didn't want to do because they didn't have an avenue to do it with and they still have a ton of other lore and references and media that they could pull inspiration from uh because they still have a whole bunch of games that they haven't even touched but maybe they are looking at a particular mechanic or function that they weren't able to explore because nothing quite fit with it so maybe that's like Part of the reason they want to have something like Liberators, and because of how Liberators is, they can keep basically Liberators going for as long as they want, throwing any and everything new that they could possibly think of inside of it. So they could keep Liberators going for, let's just say if we were to convert it to anime terms, they could keep Liberators going for like six seasons if they really wanted to, each season focusing on um, a different character or shaking up the cast, kind of like what Vanguard does, and really just being able to have an avenue to create what they want and make sure they have it be done in a meaningful way for both the card game and the lore of Digimon itself. Because certain Digimon do have like pre-established and pre-baked lore that really limits what they could possibly want to do with it. Uh, that's not the best excuse, but that's just an excuse. And maybe Liberators is going to be that freedom. Uh, I do kind of miss an anime, uh, and maybe we'll eventually get like a Liberators anime. Who knows? Uh, and maybe the Liberators anime will be completely different than the comics. Again, who knows? Um, I just think Sorry. that what Liberators is providing is something very... It's giving them the unique opportunity to do kind of what other card games are doing on top of continuing what they're already doing. So you're you're totally expecting that Liberators very much could be that potential testing ground for a lot of these fringe mechanics that maybe don't fit in with any particular lore established Digimon, but they have the freedom to experiment with it in here because there's nothing pre-established. The question then just becomes uh, how much do they want to have the flavor of these new uh, potential experimental mechanics they want to, uh, you know... They want to experiment with adding them into the game and seeing how that all interacts with the pre-established stuff. Right, because we already know what some of the Digimon are going to be. Like, we already know Black War Greymon is going to be coming back. We already know that Galactimon is going to be coming back. We know that Virus Imperial are going to be coming back. They all have pre-established decks, and I don't know if they're going to take the Waterfall, um, like rotation approach and just say okay we just need to reboot these decks give them completely new mechanical identity because the old stuff just either isn't good or uh it just doesn't fit on like theme for what the new stuff is going to be doing so there's that opportunity that they have uh allotted to them to be able to shake things up and make something different out of what we already have well, and on that topic, uh, you being a much uh, more of a lore master on on this than I am, 
are there any particular mechanics within the Digimon lore that haven't made their way to the card game that you would have any hope or uh, would there be any potential of seeing them make an appearance or uh, would the designers particularly shy away from some of these just because they're perhaps maybe a little too too strong or perhaps maybe not strong enough to be introduced that's a that's a pretty tough one because i feel like for they they have a good baseline for basically anything that they wanted to create in order to continue so i think like i want to see aplimon eventually come into the game and based on how aplimon work in the anime uh it probably would function very similarly to how digicross worked for um you know cross wars and bt10 bt11 bt12 but we also saw them experiment with um digicross in some other ways as well so maybe that mechanic could be expanded to be able to make something like that work more thematically based on how that season the anime has been done but as far as new mechanics that's they've done quite a lot and they've so far just been doing the same thing that they've been doing but better each time which is what we've seen with like mother d reaper into um yigjusil into the uh the gates the the gate of the demon lord whatever that card is called i blanking on its name um but all of those decks were basically trying to do the same thing, but better. And they kept one-upping it each time. And I think, like, there's a lot of, like, we're just going to be seeing a lot of, like, those types of repeats. Even though, flavor-wise, they're doing something completely different. Function-wise, they're doing some, they're basically doing the exact same thing. So, maybe whatever they're going to be doing for, like, the, uh, the, tw the Olympus 12, um, because that's a big faction... Maybe they can incorporate whatever they were doing for that into what the Olympus 12 could be doing. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say because they really have done a lot in a short period of time. And they're always going to be adding more mechanics. But it just feels like they are just taking something that they've already done and just making it better. And you don't want to get to a point where you're not trying to add new mechanics. Because when I think... To a large extent, that's a good way to make things start to feel stale, in a sense. If nothing particularly new or interesting is being added into the game, uh, for two sets perhaps, people, you know, the players will start to look at all the cards and be like, well, there's not really a whole lot going on here. I mean, some of the support maybe is getting... Uh, it, it might be getting power crept a little bit, so some of the new cards are more viable than the old cards, but... You definitely don't want to let your game stagnate uh, from a mechanic standpoint because then players will just kind of get into this rut of, well, I just keep seeing the same decks. There's nothing particularly new and exciting that makes me want to get into these new these new cards that are coming out in the sets. And at a certain point, when do the players say, I've had enough is enough. I've seen the same thing a hundred times uh, i'm gonna move on yeah and i i definitely feel like right now the damage that was done because of bt15 it definitely feels that way because i've been like if i didn't choose to play a different deck there was actually zero reason for me not to play red hybrids from bt12 all the way up until bt16 that's like four uh three sets technically four because of the ex set of me literally playing the exact same deck and there was zero reason for me to outside of a couple of small changes based on the meta hop off of that like red hybrids has been one of the best decks for a while and in bt17 it comes back with a force because it gets more support um and i totally like it's not that i'm getting bored with the game it's that i think there's room for them to do other things that maybe we're just not thinking about. Uh, some people will be like, oh, they should have like a new card type be locations. And I don't think that's exactly the answer. Maybe a new card type is what we need. I don't think locations would be that. Um, but 
Though, knowing Bandai, they're really good at their gimmicks, and looking at Dragon Ball Super, they, in terms of Masters, they have done a gimmick each year, and re that's really spiced up and changed the game quite a lot, so maybe we will see, like, a Zenkai card, or maybe we will see, like, a Planeswalker-type card. I I don't exactly know what that's going to look like or entail, but I... If it's one thing I know Bandai is good at, it's making overpowered gimmicks for the entire year. This year, it's Ace Cards. Ace Cards is the gimmick that's going to last through the entire year. We see it being highly promoted in every single set. Uh, it's not like they're going to drop it once uh, the year of Aces is over. It's just going to slow down for the next new gimmick. And it's just going to be transitioned into a normal part of the game. So I... I I have no idea what their next gimmick is going to be, but I think that's going to be the big, like the big mechanical change up instead of some small ones, um, like adding new keywords or whatever. That seems to, that seems to track. And also I would imagine uh, there's, there's always seems to be a tendency in a lot of the card games that I've particularly played where the meta tends to do this interesting shift where, uh, for certain periods of time, the meta is very heavily focused around aggro decks that are really fast. And then over time, it feels like the designers are trying to slow the game down. So then you'll start to see mid-range pop up at a certain point and start being pretty pro prevalent until you do a full swing to the far side of things. And now control decks are the hot new kid on the block, where... That is what all of the support's coming to, and it's just good. It helps slow down the game from the aggro meta, but then, you know, it'll start to slowly shift its way back towards it because, you know, we, we've given enough support to the slowing of the game down. Now we're going to slowly try and make the game go a little bit faster, and I think a lot of card games get into this nice pendulum swing of where... You know, where does the meta land? Are we in the aggro meta? Are we in the are we in the control meta? Are we in that mid range meta where we're you know half you know halfway between one of the swings? So considering that it sounds like the meta has been shifting to more of a more of a control style meta, I would expect to be whatever their next mechanic is is probably going to help speed the game up. Uh, which a lot of players would say is the last thing that we need, because the problem with Digimon and Control is Control is different in Digimon, because essentially, whether you're an aggro deck or control deck, half the time, the goal is still the same on just getting to your level 6 as quickly as possible. Um, BT16 definitely is going to be a more control-orientated format, because there's a reduction in interaction. So it's just like, oh, I just can't straight up delete your Digimon because it has immunity from being deleted or uh, immunity from being affected by effects in general. So uh, it, while also being a good offensive and defensive tool. So that's like the unfortunate byproduct of like where Digimon's design is currently heading us down. And I think like there is going to be a bigger consolidation than we are going to be used to in terms of what's actually playable and viable as a result because of the sheer amount of reduction in interaction. And um, based on a lot of Japanese results, we're going to get, because of this less interaction in terms of being able to just raise out, Digivolve up, delete the opponent's Digimon, punish them, and then kind of just snowball the game from there, uh, we're going to get into like this DP war where effects that increase your strength of your Digimon are going to matter more than the effects that are going to be doing other things. And that's going to be the real interesting part, is to see how that meta shift is going to impact the game as a whole, and where the game is going to go from there. Because so far, based on the early results uh, that we have with BT-17, it doesn't really look like a whole lot is actually changing compared to where it was from BT-16. Um, and, like, I guess that's just the the big slowing, like, a couple of cards and play styles and mechanics really trying to slow the game down without actually slowing it down. Because it's you're still, by turn two, going to supposed to get into your level six. Um, 
And that's the weird part with Digimon. Well, and I think you also kind of nailed the hit the nail on the head with the the analogy of control in Digimon feels very odd because in a lot of other card games you have a fair amount of interaction that can happen cross turn where while my opponent's doing you know doing their plays doing their turn there is a fair bit of interaction that I can do to disrupt my opponent's actions uh, potentially stopping them from putting down that key piece of their combo and now all of a sudden they have to rethink well how do I how do I reset up or how do I adjust to the situation now that I've kind of been put off of my tempo? Where Digimon is a lot more strictly, I'm going to do actions on my turn, you're going to sit over there and wait until I am done, and then once I am done, now it is your turn, you can do whatever you want, I'm for the most part just going to kind of sit here and wait for your turn to be over. There's not a whole lot of that cross-turn interaction, which generally makes control feel like you have or at least playing against control makes you feel like you have options because you're not locked to well there's only i can only do stuff on my turn you know there might be situations where that is particularly true but when you have those options to kind of try and disrupt the control or to do stuff to do stuff on your opponent's turn it makes it feel like you have options to slow down their build-up, where in Digimon, you don't really have that particular interaction, which probably lends itself to control not feeling that great to run up against. And that's why what control we do have is, like, very... is designed in a very specific way. Um, because, um, like, that's why Ace is, like, an absolutely fantastic mechanic, because it does that, but it also has the downside of being Ace that comes with Overflow. Uh, so it's like, I could Digivolve for free on the opponent's turn, but the move is, for the most part, heavily telegraphed. So it's just like, okay, can I play out of what their Ace could potentially do to ruin me? Uh, the other side of that coin is, like, why, uh, or how these control decks are designed where it's like Leviathan punishes the opponent for playing a Digimon by card effects. Whether that's during your turn or the opponent's turn, it doesn't matter. It's just going to use the delay option to uh, remove bodies that are going to be coming out for free. And then you're just going to have to stick and deal with this big body staring you in the face as it just wipes your board clear. Um, and that's why security control like is literally labeled security control versus any other control deck, which generally doesn't have control in its name at all, because that reduction of interaction during the opponent's turn, because they attack your security, you flip over a security bomb, now you're doing something on their turn to disrupt them, and then you have cards that can trigger during all turns to further disrupt them. So, like, it's... Control is very interesting in Digimon, and... I think like that's part of one of the other aspects that makes it unique. But as an aggro player, I don't like control and I don't care for it. Um, so get that control crap out of here. Um, but I also don't want the game to be hyper ballistic where it's just like, yeah, I'm just going to OTK you by turn two like Anubismon. And that was stupid and also not fun. So there is a fine line mechanically what they should be doing with the game as well. Uh, now, if they could just kill security control, that would be absolutely fantastic oh man imagine that the aggro adjacent player is all about hating on control who would have guessed yeah but i uh, think no i think you also make a good point you don't want the game to be spirally crazy hyper hyper rush because then you'll get into the stupid nonsense that the Yu -Oh territory that's what everyone well, calls it yeah, I, I, I know a lot of people think of Yu-Gi-Oh, but I was thinking of uh, a long time ago when I used to play in the Legacy format of Magic, where it's like, hey, did you win on turn one? All right, I guess I'm going to win now, if you didn't. I mean, that's where uh, Yu-Gi-Oh you know. currently is. Like, the game literally is a one-turn game, where it's just like, I either set up or kill you on turn one, or if I uh, didn't set up, then you better hope to have Floodgates to try to out me and then you win by default because you can do all your stuff. And if I don't have floodgates to counter you, because there's not that much like good card draw in Yu-Gi-Oh, they they do know how to manage that. Most of it is just tutoring out and playing out your combo. 
Um, but Digimon almost is at that stage where the tempo is like absolutely insanely high to just straight up kill you by turn two or three. And that's mostly thanks to like the training cards, which is why I really don't like those cards and cards like Ukamon is because they just do nothing but unnecessarily accelerate a already fast game uh, that already has problems with finding good, meaningful interaction during the opponent's turn. And that's part of the reason why people really don't like Digimon. Um, but Pokemon's in that same type of vein. So, I, and Pokemon's popular, so it's whatever. But I know this episode got a little bit on the long side. We did talk about quite a lot in terms of design um, and flavor and just mechanics. But I think this is probably a really decent place to kind of stop that. Because otherwise we could just go forever. Um, so the conversation could uh, could definitely just keep going. I mean, I, I definitely had three talking points in the back of my mind that <laughs> could keep it going. But right, I, I think I think this probably is a, it's a fairly good, decent episode. I think we covered a lot of ground in it. Yeah, hopefully this gave you some insight into um, <laughs> my buddy Mark because uh, this is his first appearance. Um, so. Thank you, Mark, for coming on. It does mean a lot uh, to take time out of your busy schedule. Oh, no. Anytime. Anytime you need somebody to, you know, I, like I said at the start of the episode, I might not be the most, like, super in-depth meta person of Digimon, but if we're talking more general mechanics applications, I'm always more than happy to come on and share my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I want to... Uh, Thank everyone for listening, especially all the way to the end. Uh, I hope you found this episode enjoyable. And again, if you want to help support the podcast, please share it with others on social media, uh, as well as doing the like rating, subscribe, review, uh, all that other social media stuff to be able to get it to spread. And thank you again for listening, and we will see you uh, next time. <laughs>